OK, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff Davis. Um, I will be uh, talking about PostgreSQL, range types, and Rust. Uh, I work for a company called Aster Data, a big data analytics company um, based in uh, the Bay Area. So uh, if any of you guys are interested in uh, employment opportunities, definitely come talk to me. Mm. So uh, first of all, kind of how I'll be going through this is uh, I, I want to make the case that powerful data types are important. Uh, the database and application should have some agreement about what those data types actually are. Um, I think range types is one of those important data types, and I'll show you about that, why I think that's important. Uh, then uh, I'll be talking about a language called Rust and its implementation of range types uh, in that application space and how it works with PostgreSQL range types. Um, I'll, uh, I'll throw, uh, first of all, a, a big thanks to uh, Stephen Fackler. He actually, uh, he's, uh, uh, I think he works for Mozilla. He works on the Rust language and he did uh, a lot of the work. Um, he wrote essentially the entire Postgres driver as well as the range type support for that himself. Uh, so big thanks to him. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the way I like to put it is, you know, quick, describe your business in terms of ints, floats, timestamps, uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, when you put it like that, it's kind of, you know, those, those timestamps or those uh, data types actually can go quite far. Um, in explaining uh, what a business is about, uh, you build a, a sophisticated schema describing the relationships between them. Uh, but when things start to get interesting, then that starts to break down and you actually want, uh, you know, something a little bit more interesting. So I'll give, you know, just a couple of examples of other successful data types that I think help make this case. Uh, these, these aren't what the talk is about. Um, but uh, full text search is kind of an obvious case uh, for anyone who's done full text search and started out with the text field and used light queries. Uh, how many people have tried that before at one time or another? Yeah, so you do the like with the percent signs and you try to implement the full text you know, solution that way. You quickly run into all kinds of problems. You know, one is uh, performance, obviously, but then beyond that, it's just really not the right data type. Uh, you know, when you're talking about a kind of an arbitrary keyword search, you're really thinking about a set of words, maybe positions, maybe word stems uh, that make up a document. Uh, you're not really concerned with, um, you know, some parts of it at all, like stop words, the, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, that, that's really, you know, one example of a data type. A lot of work has gone into that. Um, in Postgres. Uh, again, that's not what the talk is about. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, making the case that, you know, this is an interesting data type. You can try to build it out of the simple tools, but it, it ultimately doesn't work out very well. Geospatial is another example of that. Uh, PostGIS is an amazing uh, extension to Postgres, and it implements a full geospatial data type uh, useful for all kinds of uh, mapping and uh, other capabilities, um, doing geospatial analysis and geospatial queries on shapes and, and everything else. So that's, um, that's a, a very important extension in the Postgres ecosystem. And uh, sure, you can try to do that with a bunch of integer columns and try to make up shapes that way, uh, but then try and query on top of that and you run into you know, so much complexity, it's, it's really unmanageable, uh, not to mention the performance problems. Um, so, uh, you know, these, these are a few examples, and I, I think, um, uh, you know, I'll show a little later why I think range types should be included as a part of that. Um, I also think the database and the application should agree about what the data types are generally. Um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, that very quickly clears up any impedance mismatch between the database and the application if you're getting conversions between the real types you actually care about in the database and the application in a, in a consistent way. Um, so if you constantly have kind of interesting objects in your application, uh, but then you try to serialize them down to ints and, and text and so forth, then, uh, you know, it's, it's understandable that that 
you know, would be called an impedance mismatch and, and that, you know, you'd, you'd uh, uh, run into some complexity and problems converting and uh, problems querying that data consistently and treating it consistently in the database with how the, the database, uh, or the database with how the application might be manipulating that same data. Um, so, uh, range types, I'll be uh, jumping into a couple of examples here. Um, but the basic idea, I've, I've given talks on this by itself, but just the, the quick uh, version of this is that it defines uh, a range of, of values with a definite beginning and definite end. Um, it could be, the ends could be inclusive or exclusive and there, there are a few other details. But the, the bottom line is rather than it being, say, you know, a SQL interval type, uh, which might be two hours, right? And that, that defines kind of a duration of time, but it's still essentially a, um, you know, a, a scalar value. This range type actually has a definite beginning and definite end. Uh, so you really need two bits of information or uh, two pieces of information to really understand that range uh, value. Um, this is particularly useful for time ranges, I believe, because of scheduling purposes. So let me try to um, make a quick demo of this. Uh, resizing the window here. See, hopefully that's uh, big enough to be readable there. So uh, you could create a table, for instance. Uh, well, to start off, you could just uh, select a simple range by doing something like this, int for range from 1 to 10. Okay. So the first thing I'd like to point out is um, 1 to 10. The, the first, if you can't see it, is a square bracket. And the, the ending bracket, that's a parenthesis or a, a round brace. So this represents the range uh, beginning at 1 and ending at 10, including the value 1, but excluding the value 10. So because these are integers, that's a total of uh, nine values. You can do a simple uh, query on this, such as uh, this is the containment operator uh, at sign greater than. And does it contain the value 2? And we see that that's true. And also do the overlaps operator, which is double ampersand. And this is also true because these two ranges overlap. So we can see that we're no longer treating the endpoints specially. We're actually treating them like uh, more like sets or mathematical intervals to be more precise. Um, this simplifies a number of queries. Um, you know, to, to give an example of you know, a query that you might uh, try writing to implement this with just integers. So if you were to try to do overlaps, you'd end up with something like, uh, you know, um, you know, select, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, let's say you have some variable, you know, uh, start, you know, is less than, uh, you 
know, so if you, you'd imagine writing queries like this, I2, uh, you know, and then a bunch of, uh, you know, and, or, and then, you know, you'd have in there maybe mixed in if you're using null for the, the uh, unbounded ranges. If you're using null, then you'd end up with a bunch of, you know, is not null kind of predicates. It would actually end up being quite a long query. Um, not going to try writing it now just because it's, it's uh, you know, complex enough that I'll, I'm sure to make a mistake anyway. But with uh, ranges, these are quite simple to write. Um, let's say, for instance, I have an unbounded range here. So that's essentially 4 to infinity is the semantics of that, and that returns true. So you don't have to think necessarily about all these edge cases. You know, should I use greater than or equal to versus just greater than here? Uh, you know, how many different versions of comparing the first and the, and the last bound uh, do you need to actually specify overlaps? It, it gets a little bit complicated. So uh, range types just simplify things greatly, and, and that's, that's the idea behind them. Um, does anyone have uh, questions at this point? Um, yeah, there there is a way of controlling that. You can, oops. so let's say uh, it's it can be um, a little bit awkward, but let's say uh, you specify them using the same notation of the square brace and open brace. So let's say we wanted to invert it, um, uh, we can add a third optional parameter to specify open uh, open say, and then then it's the same. Uh, so what happened here is, uh, remember, we're dealing with values here. So um, this is logically the range from 1 to 10, excluding both 1 and 10. Uh, but that is equivalent value to the one displayed on the screen. Um, that's because we you know, kind of normalize it for the output representation. We don't want to distinguish between two equivalent values, which is you know, a confusing thing to do. Uh, you can distinguish between the output representations, but uh, you don't want to distinguish between two equal values. And uh, 1 to 10 exclusive, exclusive is equal to 2 to 10 inclusive exclusive. Um, so you can specify things kind of, kind of in that way. Uh, and it, it works very seamlessly uh, with the rest. So when you use overlaps, uh, contains those kinds of range operators, then everything just works and you don't have to worry about lots of special cases uh, to deal with. And that's, that's really, you know, one of the, the main things that I'm trying to do here is, you know, eliminate uh, special cases, um, trying to simplify the queries and simplify the thinking behind using ranges rather than trying to uh, use a complex series of, uh, you know, start and end bounds for the ranges uh, individually. Um, so any more questions? Right now, right now there's not. There, um, there you know, uh, probably a few different ways to do that. I mean, you could certainly do that by deconstructing the range sort of like and uh, controlling the output format as you'd like to see. Um, but right now there's, you know, Use floats. Um, there, there are so uh, ranges can be extended. So there's integer ranges, timestamp ranges, timestamp time zone ranges, date ranges, and numeric ranges, um, in the kind of out of the box. But uh, let's say you know w one thing we could do is we can define new range types. Um, my uh, um, create. Uh, Float range as um, is that enough? Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. Um, at, so as range subtype equals. Oh, I know why. 
So now we have float ranges. So we have float range 1.4 to 7.9. And then we can verify that it's a float by you know, doing something like that and see what happens. You know, if that were numeric, it would probably show all that, all that precision. Um, Oh yeah, so there, there's some. Uh, so I'll show you. That's a that's a good point. Um, so let's say we do that with the open open syntax, where it's exclusive exclusive. Oops. Um, okay, I need to. Uh, so here it stays open open. And the reason for that is because there's not a very useful definition of, you know, kind of one uh, tiny um, uh, bit in a range, you know, uh, one tiny increment of a range uh, to normalize it. So um, although the float type technically is, you know, a discrete type, it's got a, you know, finite number of bits in the representation. Um, and so therefore, there will always be that one next value uh, in theory, that's that's not very useful from a uh, reasoning standpoint in most situations. Um, so uh, you could, um, if if you're uh, very uh, nitpicky about it, you could try to, to create you know a range, two ranges that were actually um, equal in the sense that they represented the same set of values, but might not be seen that way by the system. Um, because we don't use that kind of float increment uh, notion. So, um, you know, we treat floats essentially like numerics where there is no one single next value. Um, Personally, I would argue yeah. exactly what you guys are saying. Integers is not as good. Everybody sees around bucket three integers, around bucket one, but it's still bucket two. Um, I mean, the. Yeah. 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 Round. Um, oh, s sorry. So, you mean just the convention that I. that of the. Inclusive and then exclusive. You, you. What convention are you accustomed to? No, well, basically in the previous example, the integers are reduced around bracket one, not just still bracket two. Okay, so but uh, you, you mean um, even if uh, the the range were specified as as say square bracket two comma ten round no, bracket? It's fully specified as two round round bracket. Certainly not not two round. round okay, round. yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, the, the reasoning behind that is that the values are equal and should be treated that way um, in, in all contexts by the, the database system. Um, so that was, that was my reasoning for that. Um, I mean, uh, that, that, yeah, uh, it was, um, okay. Um, uh, I'll uh, kind of move on a little bit. Uh, the, you know, we're getting into a few of the details about ranges, and that's that's not uh, entirely what the presentation is about. So I'd like to make sure I, I introduce some of the other concepts I'd like to talk about. Uh, but uh, I, I think um, we all have a feel for what the range types are trying to accomplish and what they're trying to simplify. Um, and they they accomplish several things, including you know performance and uh, just the understandability of the query. So let me come back here. Yeah, so um, this is, uh, um, you know, kind of what, uh, what range types are really adding. So, you know, you use beginning and end columns, and then you can end up with these long, messy queries uh, trying to specify simple things like overlaps. Um, and that, that turns into a problem. Um, it's inconvenient. It's error prone. It's awkward. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of mistakes you can make. Uh, no indexing support. Um, for uh, if you're just specifying as individual integers like that, the best you have are ordinary B tree indexes on those integer columns, and you're not going to get the performance you expect uh, from that kind of a uh, from you know the, the kind of queries you actually want to run, which are you know the overlaps, intersection, that kind of thing. Hmm. 
And then uh, just to you know, handle some of the details like empty ranges and so forth. Yes? Right, yeah. So uh, if you use the beginning and end column, I think um, the point was that you have to pay very close attention to the convention that you've developed. Uh, so for instance, it becomes hard to use sometimes the open-close notation or sometimes the closed-open notation, um, something like that. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, so. And then uh, one uh, killer feature for range types is exclusion constraints. So uh, the idea here is a schedule conflict is a very simple notion just in everyday conversation. Everyone knows what a schedule conflict is. But to actually enforce uh, non-overlapping schedules in a database system, any database system other than Postgres has major problems with this. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, you could try, you know, if you actually try to avoid the race conditions, um, then you could end up locking the entire table or resorting to some other very strange, um, you know, series of procedural code or, or locking pattern or something like that. But ultimately, you know, it's not going to perform very well. It's going to be very complicated. Um, or you can try a simple strategy of maybe locking the whole table, or you could, uh, you know, uh, essentially, um, you know, break it into these larger values than you'd really like to deal with uh, to make it kind of, you know, to chunk it into uh, time slots, which is what a lot of people end up doing. Um, but it's really awkward and it, it causes a lot of problems. But I'll show how we can overcome that very easily. Uh, using Postgres with a declarative constraint that performs well using uh, index lookups with similar performance characteristics to a, say, unique constraint. And we get kind of the best of all worlds. So let me give an example of that. Okay. So. So this is TSTZ means timestamp with time zone range. So it's a range of timestamp with time zone. And then, um, okay, we'd ordinarily have like maybe a, a user range or something like that. Okay. Yeah, who, who, who has not made that mistake? <laughs> um, okay, so. Uh, what we could do is we could um, first uh, let's add uh, the exclusion constraint. Okay. So, um, oh, one uh, minor detail: we actually need to make use of the uh, B-tree gist extension for this example to work. So, um, because of the create extension syntax, that makes it very easy. Stephen. Uh, I, I think I'd raised that at one point. Um, it's it's a possibility. So uh, just, you know, a lot of people like, yeah. don't. You know, they, they go to use range types and they realize that they need a gist index and then they're like, but wait, I need more than just my one column. Put the range, you know, the range. Yeah, type. exactly. Yeah. So that's that? <laughs> yeah. It's it's a problem. You know, essentially everyone runs into. So to make full use of this, you really need the B tree gist extension. It's been there for a while. It works pretty well. Um, not not too much to be concerned about there. So uh, hopefully that could end up in core eventually, or there could be an easier way to 
to include it. Um, so uh, then uh, let's alter table, add exclude for exclusion constraints. Using gist, uh, this is the index access method that's going to help us enforce uh, this constraint in a, in a performant way. Uh, so um, room with equality and duration with overlaps. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. So alter table reservation. Okay, there we go. So if we so we have this exclude using just room with equals means you know if the room is the same duration with overlaps means if the durations overlap then we have a conflict. So we're describing the conflict condition here um, using the syntax is a little bit funny. Um, but we're uh, describing the conditions under which two tuples conflict. They conflict if the room is the same and the duration overlaps. And that's how, that's how to read that. So, you know, let's go ahead and, you know, insert some reservations into reservation room. So one, two, three reserves um, room 45A. Or um, do, um, Even have uh, decent errors for the parse errors in, the <laughs> um, in these values. So okay, so we inserted one uh, for essentially right now. Um, so reser reserving my own speaking time, and then let's say uh, you know user 423 comes in reserves 45a uh, for uh, 1320. Let's say to Fourteen forty-five. Then we get an error. Um, so we can go through a bunch of permutations here uh, if we had uh, more time. Um, but you know, the bottom line is that it prevents these overlapping reservations. Um, it does it declaratively, meaning that if you have uh, tuples in there already, you add the exclusion constraint later, it's going to fail. Uh, adding the constraint, just like a unique check would fail if you added it after you have duplicate values in the table. Um, it uh, works concurrently. Uh, you know, unless there's a real conflict, one transaction won't actually sit there. Or I should say, unless there's a, a real potential conflict of things that actually overlap or actually uh, meet this conflict condition, then um, the uh, transactions won't wait on each other. They'll proceed. So uh, we have kind of the best of, of all worlds here um, in, in terms of enforcing this kind of a constraint. Uh, so uh, that's really the value of combining range types with exclusion constraints um, to, to enforce these kinds of things. And there's actually some, some pretty interesting other things that you can do related to this. Um, so uh, I, I encourage you to experiment a little bit. I, I think I wrote a couple blog posts a while ago when, when these features were introduced. So, um, you know, I, I encourage people to check that out. There's other people who wrote blog posts as well. But, uh, questions at this point? Yeah, I was just wondering if there are any shortcuts to having the index points which uh, the third tuple range type and the 
Oh, uh, you mean, so I, I think, so we're using GIST, which I think you're saying doesn't support index-only scans, is, is that correct? Um, I, I actually don't know off the top of my head whether it does or not, but if, if you say it doesn't, I don't think there's a fundamental reason why GIST wouldn't work with index-only scans. So um, I think that that's just a matter of making sure we get that support you know, in. I think the intention is index-only scans should work with all index types. Sure, well, you might think, why well, wouldn't that have actually because it's almost closed for one set of data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, great. So that was is just a matter of code then, or something? Yeah. Something? It, it, okay. Great. I mean, it's not contemporary for all these industries, but for those that have enough information and the values that it gives us, it's that, that I think it's important. Right. Yeah. That. Um, uh, the index, of course, in order to do an index-only scan, you need to be able to reconstruct the entire value properly. And so um, the methods for range types make that possible um, to, to construct the whole value. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem, assuming we, you know, after we add all this uh, support to these other index access methods. OK, so let's uh, jump back to presentation. <coughs> oh, I'm already, what's going on? Oh. So let's move back there. OK. Um, Okay, so Rust. Uh, first of all, uh, who here uh, hopefully knew that Rust was a programming language uh, written by Mozilla? Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of an interesting uh, language. Um, so uh, it's it's got um, it's got a native Postgres driver. Okay, um, okay so uh, basically uh, range types, um, or sorry, Rust. Uh, offers you know a few advantages it's a systems oriented programming language so it's you know uh, a little bit more verbose uh, but it's very safe it uh, prevents any kind of uh, you know the, the ordinary kinds of memory errors like null pointer exceptions um, you know any kind of you know the seg faults those types of things are eliminated by uh, rust's type system <coughs> yet it offers very good control over memory and does not require the use of a garbage collector. So it's a suitable systems programming language. Uh, it's still in, de in development um, uh, by Mozilla. Uh, but the idea is that um, you know, bringing safety to uh, the kinds of applications people are writing that um, have uh, you know, high performance requirements, especially you know, requirements about controlling the, the memory. Uh, in many cases right now, uh, C and C++ are kind of the only games in town, um, you know, if you want to have good control over memory, aside from a few other languages that uh, are used in, in certain verticals maybe, but uh, for the most part C and C++ are the ones out there. Uh, so Rust offers an alternative to those that are safe from the kinds of memory errors that are so common in those languages. Um, and it's, you know, because the systems programming language it's also fairly fast. Uh, the, the Rust Postgres driver is, uh, again, written by um, Stephen Fackler. Uh, is, it's a native driver, um, so it doesn't require the use of libdq. And that's kind of nice because it's a little bit more flexible and, and doesn't have as uh, many dependencies. Um, so uh, the reason I'm talking about Rust, um, it's a very new language. It's not even uh, solidified yet. But the reason I'm talking about it is um, because uh, they're doing a lot of interesting things, and they're the first ones to support range types. And I think that the way it was done was very nice and a good il illustration of both the lang you know, of, of all of uh, you know the things I'm I'm talking about here, which is the the uh, language making good use of uh, the database as well as having coherent notions of of the same data types. 
um, so that that way, uh, you know, um, the application is not using a totally different set of data types from the database. Um, and I think some of the language features add to that. A lot of it is simply just because uh, it's, this is the first implementation of range types in application space that, that can talk uh, with Postgres. Um, and there's other cool things going on. I, I think you know they're developing. It's written at Mozilla, so of course uh, uh, they're developing a browser engine uh, in this language called Servo. And uh, then other people are doing some kind of cool things. There's um, like tiny operating system projects uh, going on that are mostly just for learning now. But there's a, a cool uh, blog post series by somebody named Julia Evans. Um, so uh, anyway, this, this isn't about a rundown of the features, but just this is why I chose it. Um, and it's, it's largely because you know, it, it seems to be a good fit for range types. Um, it has the, uh, um, it, the generic type system is prob probably the big one because that's what allows, uh, just like we defined a new range type over floats in five seconds uh, uh, you know, during the demo. You know, that also, um, you know, that generics power also needs to be present in the programming language to really get the full benefit of range types. Uh, from the database because in Postgres it's you know a generic type, a generic container, um, and so the the fact that the programming language can support that too is important to get the full benefit. Um, so uh, I'm gonna kind of uh, throw some code up. I know um, since most of you, uh, you know, almost everyone has not really heard of Rust, and you know, very few people are really writing in it, but. Um, I'll show kind of what I was what I was hacking on. This is not um, this is not a real project. I'm not launching this as a <coughs> as an open source project, but this is something I was working on. So let me get my mouse back. Okay, so okay, so okay, is that readable? Uh -oh. That is not very readable. Um, okay, good. Well, okay, good thing those are just the comments. So anyway, okay, so. Um, I'll kind of ignore some of the boilerplate, but this is basically uses an HTTP library to act as a server. Um, and then we'll have a kind of a simple web page interaction here. Uh, very rough, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, basically I've got this get content method and it's just, you know, generating some content dynamically and then outputting it. Um, so, uh, you can see it's a little bit more verbose to satisfy the type system than you might be accustomed to in something like Python, um, but uh, hopefully they they work out some you know good conventions to make that um, you know not so bad. Uh, so anyway, we're just you know connecting to Postgres, um, and then you know uh, appending some simple HTML and a string. And then uh, here's where we start to do the database interaction. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to select some integer ranges from a table called x. And uh, then just kind of iterate through those. Uh, the interesting part, though, is we're going to um, have another query in the application language here, which is itself a range. And we're going to. Uh, print it in uh, print the range from the database in green if it does not overlap with this range. We're going to print it in red if it does overlap, indicating a potential conflict. Um, of course, a real application would be doing something more interesting, but um, you can uh, kind of extrapolate from here. So one of the the other nice things about Rust is that it's got a macro system, and that was another reason it kind of fit in with the whole ideal that, that I'm uh, describing here. So it actually allows us to have syntax like this. This is not really just a function call. We've got actually matching with the Postgres behavior of uh, the uh, bound inclusiveness, um, the square bracket and the round bracket here indicating inclusive and exclusive respectively. Um, and then, you know, inside we've got uh, these, uh, these values here, and it uses that to construct the range. So this is uh, from 50 to 60. 
uh, being a systems programming language, it's got you know these kind of literals are are uh, tagged. You know, for for instance, for an integer, um, there you know you say i32 or some kind of you know uh, native integer size or whatever you want. Um, but here I'm just trying to keep it simple. They're an int4 range. We want it to be an int4 range in the application. That means we're using i32, uh, so it's unamb unambiguous. Um, so we have that kind of query there, and here's you know kind of the uh, loop. So for every row in the result, um, we start off with it as a, a green color, and then we actually replace the color with red if the intersection is empty, which is another way of saying that there's an overlap. And then we just output this format string, uh, including both the color and the value. And uh, then we're done. So uh, there's actually something else very interesting, I think, going on here. But I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so, so now let's uh, make sure it fits. Okay. So let's build it. A um, few imports that I'm not using, so I get warned about that. It takes a while to compile. Um, They'll hopefully fix that when the language is more finished. And then, um, oh, now I need to actually go back here. I need a browser, so. bunch of int4 ranges there. So <coughs> we can see I'm reloading it. And so 10 to 20 does not, inter does not overlap with 50 to 60. 10 to 200 does. Uh, 30 to 51 does. But 30 to 49 does not. And if we go back to uh, the Postgres session, uh, we can find table x. And we can insert into x values, okay, we're just about out of time here, so I'm going to try and make this quick. Um, int for range. Uh, somebody have a range they'd like me to insert? 1050. 1050? Yeah. OK, so first let's decide whether this should uh, overlap or not. And then we'll see, based on the red-green color, whether it does. So. Uh, what should the inclusivity and exclusivity of this 1050 range be? What would we expect that to be? Yeah, exactly. So it will exclude, it will include 10, but exclude 50. And then we can look back at the Rust code. And we see that this includes uh, 50, excludes 60. So since this one excludes 60, or sorry, since this one includes 50 and the other one excludes 50 that we just inserted, we would expect this to appear in green. Uh, is there a question back there? Oh, okay. So let's. And it's green. Um, so uh, let me, um, I'll just wrap up and ask, ask uh, for any questions here in a second. But uh, one other thing I'd like to point out that's, that I think is, is quite interesting about this is the way Rust's type system works is uh, see that we just declared uh, this value to be a range of int32 in Rust equals the first value in that row coming from the database. Um, now, what's interesting is this is able to choose what conversion function to apply in order to get the int4 range out of the database and into Rust based on this line. So it's actually based on the, the type of the value you're reading it into. Um, uh, in other words, kind of the return value of the expression. Uh, it's able to infer the, uh, uh, you know, of course, the type that this should be 
but beyond that, it's able to actually use that to choose the conversion function. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty cool approach. I think a lot of other languages do a lot of um, kind of messing around with OIDs and then forcing the output type uh, and you know trying to include the fixed uh, constant OIDs of the types they know about. And this makes it more extensible because as you add, say, new range types and new conversion functions, then it works more seamlessly. You don't need to find the OID and hard code it someplace necessarily. For good error checking, you might want to, um, but that becomes optional. So this, I think, has a better chance of working well with user-defined data types and then user-defined ranges on top of those user-defined data types and really seeing the full extensibility that Postgres has to offer. So um, I just see a lot of uh, great interaction between what Rust can do with types, what, what it can do uh, on the database side, how Postgres works and Postgres's strengths and how they all fit together very well. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this is kind of a great example. I think other languages can do a lot of these things too. Um, but, you know, like I said, of course, Rust is the first one to support range types uh, natively. Um, so, uh, from here, I'll just uh, take questions. A range back into. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Uh, no, we don't have a, a way to do that. This also supports these kind of continuous ranges of numeric, where it would be, you know, kind of essentially, yeah, it would be essentially infinite sets or something. So, uh, it might be an interesting area to explore, but, you know, right now the range types don't do anything like that. Yeah, yeah. I say again. Right. Yeah. There, there's uh, quite a few uh, interesting ways of manipulating and, and uh, operators laid out in um, a book uh, that I believe Hickey may have read as well. <laughs> that um, it's called Temporal Data in the Relational Model um, by uh, C. J. Date and uh, Nic Nicholas Lorenzos or uh, Date and Lorenzos. Um, and I think Hugh Darwin as well. But, uh, anyway, so that uh, another question over here. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. I, I think that um, that's been uh, brought up. So Postgres. INET data type is already has supports the net mask, so it's not a totally ordered type itself. Um, so it it's like an, just an awkwardness. Uh, I believe you're right, and I agree, but it's an awkwardness because we need to define a new totally ordered type that doesn't support the net mask in order to have that. As, as a sort of a, a logic follow-up, INET range is really, really simple. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, just, oh, just a question about 
Oh, yeah. If you create a range here, you can just do an insert statement, and it, it supports kind of a two SQL trait uh, that allows it to convert back and go right into Postgres. So you don't need to do any special conversion to get the range back into Postgres after you've manipulated it in REST. Um, you mean if the lower bound is higher than the upper bound? Uh, that will generate an error. Um, I've gotten that request um, several times. Somebody was trying to describe a use case to me. I, I don't think I fully understood uh, the use case for that. But it, for, for what? Oh, okay. Um, I, uh, you could work, you know, if you just wanted it to flip it, that would be fairly easy to do programmatically. Um, it, it's not supported now. Um, we, yeah. I mean, we decided, yeah. Um, it, the idea was um, that if somebody wanted to do something like that, it, it was most likely an error, and it's better to throw an error when it's it's, it's a likely case, and then support the other case. You know, if you need to with with procedural code, um, I think that was the thinking at the time. Um, but if if I understand better some of the use cases out there for it, I, I'd reconsider. Um, if the s s say again, sorry, I can't hear well. Yeah, you could have, if both of them are exclusive, you just end up with a singleton range in that case, and, and it's a range consisting of exactly one value. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's yeah. That's a, a pretty powerful use case. Does Rust have the similar concept of empty ranges? Too? Yes, it does. It's got empty ranges as well. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, you guys, if you were. Uh, so don't know if I tested this one, but I guess in the spirit of a live demo, we'll see what happens. Um, and an empty range doesn't interact with anything, so this would be the expected result. Do you know if the Rust people came up with the semantics of this thing from scratch? <laughs> well, I, they looked at Postgres. I mean, I, was, I filed a ticket at, at uh, the GitHub uh, repository for the Rust Postgres project, and uh, Stephen Fackler just took an interest and uh, looked into Postgres. He was already, you know, fairly comfortable, I think, at this point with the Postgres documentation because he had actually implemented a native driver. So uh, I, I imagine, you know, he, you know, he just looked at a lot of the documentation, and I, I gave some feedback, but he, for the most part, just got this stuff, um, you know, very close to the Postgres semantics right away, and so. Um, I mean, that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make, is that the semantics should match rather than having, you know, having them inconsistent. Okay, well, thank you, everyone.